el tema innovación social. Eh, comenzamos inmediatamente con la presentación. Mr. Morgan, welcome. Thank you. Okay, good, good evening, friends. Um, I have had a very good day here in Medellín with some of these organizations here. Uh, and I was told to come to a party this evening, a campus party, uh, for a little bit of dancing, a little bit of drinking. Uh, and I'm asking, where is the, uh, where's the guaro? <laughs> where's the rumba? <laughs> you all look very serious here. So, <clears throat> what I would like you to do before I start is what I sometimes ask when I do a talk is please shake hands with the person closest to you who you don't know. Do you understand? Shake hands, the person closest to you you have never met before. Okay, because I, I am going to be talking about social interaction and you can kiss them if you want, but shaking hands is okay. What, what I want to talk about with you is useful revolutions. And in particular, I want to talk about these things. You all have one of these things, I hope. There are seven, million, seven billion of these things around the world, but I think we don't use them anything like enough. We waste our brains, and we often get the cleverest brains working on the wrong questions and the wrong challenges. So, my talk for you is about three revolutions, three useful revolutions worth being part of. And what I'm going to say is partly prompted by having been at another campus party in London last month where there were, I think, about six or seven thousand people gathered from all over Europe. And the campus party there is all about entrepreneurship and about technology, but it's also everywhere about how the best brains, the most creative brains, do the most useful work, the most impactful work. And that's what I want to talk about here in Medellin. So, the first revolution is a revolution in how we democratize innovation. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay. For much of the last century, innovation was all about scientists in buildings like these, chemical laboratories, Bell Labs, which is where the microprocessor came from, a small number of people with PhDs creating amazing breakthroughs in science. Now that kind of innovation remains very important, but more and more in the world of business, innovation is being opened out. We have user-driven innovation, innovation in services as well as technologies. We have open innovation projects in government, in business, all basically with the same idea, how does the company, how does the state make the most of many brains, not just the brains inside the organization. And I think we are at the beginning of a decade or two when we go much further to democratize how innovation is organized. And I'm going to say a little bit about what that means in practice. First of all, we are seeing a spread of prizes, challenge prizes, where a task is set, maybe to design a new kind of light or a new microphone, and whoever can succeed in this task wins a prize. The prize may be a million dollars, maybe $10 million. And my organization now has a center for prizes where we set uh, technology prizes of all kinds. And for me, the symbol of this new era is this young man. Do any of you know, recognize him? Do any of you recognize this guy here? So he is 15 years old. I think he is younger than any of you. And he won the Intel Science Prize last year, having developed a test for pancreatic cancer, 
which is much cheaper and more efficient than anything coming from the big firms, the big laboratories, the big universities. He taught himself on the internet how to create a test for cancer. And he, for me, is a symbol of this era of opening innovation, democratizing innovation. You do not have to be at Harvard or Oxford. You do not have to work for General Electric or IBM. You can be on the forefront of innovation wherever you are, whoever you are. And this is very exciting. The next field of democratization is the spread of accelerators. And many of you, I'm sure, are part of the accelerator movement. My organization now organizes accelerators across Europe. We have hundreds of them working with entrepreneurs to speed up the process of creating new business models, new markets, new technologies. And uh, this graph here shows the rise of numbers of accelerators. This is our living map of European accelerator programs. And again, this is saying that people coming straight out of university can create not just startup businesses, but high quality startup businesses, which can quickly grow to scale, make money, satisfy big markets. And this is a transformation of buildings, of cities all over the world now taking place. The third of these democratizing trends is the spread of micro-manufacturing, 3D printing, 4D printing. Manufacturing is still being done in very big factories in Japan and China and Germany, but it's also becoming something you can do in your own neighborhood, in your own home, in small fab labs, and so on. And the whole of manufacturing is changing from being about subtraction, where you start with lots of materials and end up with something much smaller, and it's becoming instead about addition, where you add layers of substances to create a chair or to create an electronic equipment. And this too, I think, will democratize innovation in ways we are only just beginning to understand. The fourth field I want to mention is something we are very involved in in my organization. And you can see it happening in this room. Here is the idea that instead of creating a new generation of people who use PowerPoint, Excel, Apple products, what we really need is a new generation of people who can create digital products. A generation of digital makers, not just of digital users. And with partners like Mozilla, we have created this thing called Make Things Do Stuff, which is a platform and a program to help children as young as five learn how to code, how to make games, how to make websites, how to make animations, so that they become very confident at not being passive consumers of Facebook, but rather the designers of the next Facebook. And all over the world, this movement of coding and making, I think, is very exciting. Uh, it is mainly being led by young people. It is quite threatening to many teachers, many established institutions. But this is the way we have to go to democratize innovation. So that's the first revolution, which I think is a revolution worth being part of. The revolution which takes innovation away from just being something for the elite, just being for scientists, just being for top universities, and makes it something everyone can play a part in shaping their world. Now the next revolution I want to talk about is, is the social innovation revolution. And this overlaps in many ways. All around the world we can see thousands of new ideas, new projects, new ventures in, in fields like these. From you know, Wikipedia, to citizen reporters, to slow food, to health collaboratives. A an extraordinary explosion of social innovation, innovation for social good is happening. And one of the things which is driving this revolution is a revolution of new ways of supporting innovation for social good. 
This is a list of things happening around the world, none of which existed 10 years ago. There are, in cities like Bilbao and Singapore now, social innovation parks, areas of the city which become centers for social innovation. Medellin should have one of these soon. There are social innovation camps to accelerate development of ideas uh, and design. Many countries now have social innovation funds to finance the development of ideas and getting them to scale. In in Europe, we now have about 300 social innovation incubators, spaces providing support for people with good ideas to grow them. Uh, President Obama has an office of social innovation in the White House. We have at city level mayors defining their term of office through social innovation, with probably the lead one being um, uh, Wonsoon Park, who is the mayor of Seoul, the most digitally connected city in the world, and he is redefining the city government, a city of 11 million people, entirely as a social innovation city. We have social innovation prizes in the US, in Europe, in China. So in Europe, we just gave the, the most recent set of prizes for innovations to help young people into jobs. And some of them were very, very creative ideas, like an, a, an app which can help with multi-dimensional barter. Uh, another innovation taking uh, things like food packaging and making it a source of jobs information for young people. In China, the winner of last year's Social Innovation Prize is a social enterprise for disabled people, which employs 3,000 of them. So big scale being achieved. And there's also things like social impact bonds. Uh, and I hear that Medellin may be one of their cities with a, a social impact bond uh, pioneering that idea. Behind all of this has been a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of books, a lot of thinking about how innovation happens in the social field and how it's different from traditional innovation in nanotechnology or aerospace or cars. And again, almost none of this literature existed 10 years ago. This is new. It is pioneering new ways of thinking about the world. And if you haven't seen it already, one of the organizations, part of my trip here to Colombia is SIX, the Social Innovation Exchange, which links together the people doing this work across the world. So we share experience, we share ideas. This is a picture from the launch of the um, uh, Six Asia in Hong Kong last year. And there are separate nodes in Scandinavia, Australia, uh, and North America. What I want to talk about then is some of the lessons about how you get ideas from being just a, a promising idea to having real impact. And one of the things we've been doing is trying to help innovators understand how you navigate your way through the innovation spiral. From starting with a, an opportunity, a challenge, a problem, something you see, through generating really good ideas, testing them, refining them, turning them into business models, and then scaling them. And one of the things I'm going to emphasize is the importance of doing all of these stages. So often people come up with answers before they've really understood what is the problem they are trying to solve. Often in the social innovation world, people are very good at creativity, but then they can't turn their pilot project into something which actually is sustainable, which really has an impact on people's lives. So we're trying to help the people in this field become much more practical, much more rigorous, much more disciplined about the business of innovation. I want to talk through a few current examples of where social innovations have gone all the way through that spiral. Because I think these are the inspirations for people working on a small project to see how you could become really big. This is one of the biggest. How many of you have heard of this organization? 
nobody. So Pratam in India is an educational organization which has 20 million pupils. 20 million pupils. And they worked very hard on understanding the needs of slum children in India. They worked very hard to refine their ideas and they came up with a very simple model of providing education. They stripped it down to its essentials so it could be replicated. Then they developed funding methods which allowed it to, to spread from city to city to city. So they went through every step of that process in order to reach large numbers at low cost with big impact. I'm involved in a, 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 an initiative partly inspired by Pratam and also inspired by Escuelas Nuevos here in Colombia. And this is called Studio Schools here. And we've tried to develop a new kind of school for teenagers where the teenagers will fight to get in, not fight to stay out. And to do that, a studio school is very like this room in some ways. Most of the curriculum is done through real life projects, innovating, developing new concepts, working with businesses in industries like uh, space or marine technology or engineering. And very little is in fact like what you're doing, sitting in classrooms listening to teachers. And we find this method of learning where it's real life practical projects is much more motivating for young people. Their exam results go up dramatically, and that's why we, are, we have 50 schools open next year in the UK, and we are working with Pratam to take this model also to India. But again, a lot of the success of this depended on very hard work refining the model, making sure its cost structure was at a level where it could be replicated, making sure we provided the support for each school so it could deliver with integrity and with quality. Another example of scale is this one, um, uh, Brack from Bangladesh. This is now, I think, the world's first or second largest NGO. About 150,000 employees and one of the most entrepreneurial organizations in the world providing finance for farmers, people in the cities, providing schooling, running universities, running healthcare. And this on its own, this organization, along with Grameen, has made Bangladesh one of the success stories of development of the last 20 or 30 years. And it's because of, again, the combination of creativity and discipline to get them to work. Another example from South Africa that I like is this one, Seoul City, which uses television soap operas combined with um, community development and health to support people to improve their own lives in poor uh, communities across South Africa. And again, they worked very hard to come up with a scalable model, a model which could work not just in one city, but with a support infrastructure could quickly be replicated right across the country. So these are all, um, and just one more I show is Avaz. These are examples of innovation, social innovation going to large scale. H how many of you are members of Avaz? A few of you. So there are now 20 million of you worldwide using Avaz as a platform for politics, for campaigning, and the designers of Avaz are creating many, many other um, useful tools. One, in fact, which I like very much is in the city of Rio de Janeiro, Mayu Rio, where they've created a web platform for young people to organize themselves in the city and influence City Hall. And we are now copying that back in the UK, and it's worth looking at for Medellin. It might be an interesting uh, example to, to borrow. So, what is all of this about? Going back to my image of a brain, the wasted brain, this is a quotation from an Indian entrepreneur who is now the advisor to the Indian Prime Minister on Innovation. And he says the problem with capitalism is the best brains spend their time working on the problems of the rich who don't need it, not the problems of the poor who do. I see this in my country, very clever people come out of business school to try and design a new kind of club class air travel. 
a new luxury hotel model, the latest BMW. You know, this is fine, but this is such a waste of people's brain power. And how much more could be achieved if that same intelligence was tapped to solve important problems? So in India, in the last 10 or 20 years, there's been a movement to reinvent innovation, to try and innovate for social purposes, and also to tap the creativity of poor people. In India, it's called Jugad, which is a, a term for barefoot, grassroots innovation, often using very simple ideas like this. I, I was shown earlier today some Colombian examples of very cheap and simple prosthetic limbs, hands and feet. Uh, and Jugad has done this as well in India, so that for 10 or $20 you give someone a new hand rather than it costing $40,000 like it would in the US. And this is a slide I, I showed from one of our reports looking at all the examples of frugal innovation in India, where they are reducing the cost of the product and also the cost of the process. So the Nano here, this is a car, a very cheap car, much cheaper than anything General Motors could, could build. The Akash is a tablet which retails for about $50. Um, they do heart surgery at a fraction of the cost of American, or I think Colombian hospitals as well. And this is a whole field of innovation trying to bring the costs down in order to achieve social impact and social purpose. Now, one of the things which is driving this in different parts of the world is new kinds of money. If you're an entrepreneur, you need money. You need money at the early stage. You need money as a startup. You need money to grow. You need money to get very big. And around the world, one of the interesting developments now is new sources of capital to fuel social investment. Some of these are crowdfunding platforms uh, like Kickstarter or Crowdcube or People Fund It. Um, some of these are also social investment funds. I've been telling colleagues here in Colombia about our biggest success in Britain which was to find unclaimed bank accounts, the bank accounts people had forgotten they had, and we persuaded the government to give all the money from the forgotten bank accounts to create a new bank for social investment. And that bank now has about $1 billion for investment in social enterprises, a big sum of money. And in every country there are hidden pools of money which you can find and bring to life, make useful, make a fuel for this field. I've also been sharing a little bit about work on what we call iTeams. So we've been working with uh, Michael Bloomberg, in the mayor of New York, and his foundation to understand the new kinds of innovation team around the world which are within cities, or within governments, or within regions. And we found about a hundred of these and have been trying to understand how they work. And there's a new generation of these in countries like Finland, in Malaysia, in the UK, Australia, France, uh, Korea. And all of these are bringing the sort of the spirit you would get at a campus party, the spirit you would get at a really innovative private company and putting that into the heart of government. And usually they operate with a very different culture to bureaucracies. They are usually younger. They usually mix bureaucrats and people from outside. They work very, very fast. So in some of the I-teams, they try and work from an idea to implementation in four or five weeks and have it tested within two or three months, which is very unusual for governments and bureaucracies. Some of them use design methods, like MindLab in Denmark is a design-driven uh, uh, team within a national government. Many of them are using data and technology, like the new I-teams in Mexico and, uh, and Argentina. 
and some of them new, use new social science. So this one here, the Behavioral Insights team in Britain uses behavioral economics methods to redesign public policies and run very large experiments. And they will be experiments in things like letters for tax. So they find if they send you know, half of you a letter saying, why have you not paid your tax on time? You may respond in one way. And then they have another group, they will change the letter so it says, nine out of 10 people have paid their tax on time. Why have you not paid your tax on time? And then for the next group, they try adding in the words, nine out of 10 people like you or in your street have paid your tax on time. And they find this group responds much better than this group. And these are all the methods which are normal for companies like Amazon or Google, where you do A-B testing of every service. You automatically test it digitally and get evidence about what works. But for government, this is very new, a very new spirit, very new tools, very new uh, methods. So the third revolution I want to talk about, in a way, overlaps with the other two. And this is about how we get technologies which are really useful for us. And there's an enormous amount of technology in this room. And so the question is, how do we get, again, the brains of the world, the clever people, the scientists, the technologists, creating real value, value for the people around them, in their community, in their society? At the moment, most of the investment in research and development goes either into hardware, things like iPhones, or into the military. About one half of all public research and development funding across the world goes into better ways of killing people. Smart missiles, or drones, or cluster bombs. And we probably can't stop that happening, but it seems to me it would be much better if the same amount of brain power of clever people's time went into solving some more useful challenges than just a slightly better colored new iPhone. And I think the latest iPhone is a little bit of a disappointment. Or a slightly faster drone. And, you know, we are looking at why, why can't we have the same innovation creativity for problems like pollution or poverty or drug addiction, or crime, or isolation amongst older people, which is a problem right across the world from China to Germany. And in every society, we find only a tiny fraction of the clever people working in these problems, rather than trying to design the next generation flat screen TV, or the next generation tank. And so one of the questions I would throw to anyone who is a a technologist, an entrepreneur, is make sure you are working on things which are really useful so that when you are 95 years old, sitting in your armchair, looking back on your life, you feel proud of what you did, proud of how you use your brain to make the world a better place. Now, that's not easy. And I want to show a, a picture I showed on, um, on Tuesday in New York. I was trying to annoy an audience of data scientists. Do any of you recognize this picture? So this is a picture of data, big data. This one here. And this is a picture which showed the houses where people died of cholera. And it connected them to where people were drawing their water in London. Now, the date of this big data analysis, can you guess what date this is? Anyone? The date is 1854. Okay, 1854, 150 years ago. And the challenge I threw out to the data scientists in New York is where is the use of open data, which is achieving even a fraction of the impact of this application of data matching from long before the computer, broadband networks, and so on. I'm a great believer in the power of data, and I will show you some good examples in a moment, 
but too much of what is being done with open data is trivial, is not really affecting anyone's life, not really generating any real value. And what happened here was to start with really important real-life problems and then develop your innovation in response to problems which matter rather than just starting with cool applications, nice ideas. Because you're wasting your brain power if you work on trivial problems rather than big ones. So, what I'm going to share with you is just a few examples of digital technology applications for social good, which I think are quite useful and promising, but they're all ones which could go much further in the future. So, the first category is new ways of matching people's needs, things they need, with underused resources. And in every city in the world, there are lots of resources which are wasted. They're like buildings or time or equipment which could be better linked up using digital technology with the people who really need it. And here's a few examples. So in, in China, Taobao, which is their equivalent of eBay, is now moving beyond selling old clothes or watches, but is linking up people who need care, like isolated older people, with people who can provide them with care. So using digital technology to create a welfare system for care. In London, we have a nice example which my organization designed so that public libraries can mobilize the book collections of citizens and their book collections become part of the public library service so you can online look for a book, discover someone in your apartment block has that book and you go and knock on their door and borrow it from them and you not only get value, you may meet a new friend or you may meet a neighbor you never want to see again but hopefully uh, they are good people. And all over the world, there is a, 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 a proliferation of these collaborative consumption tools. This is a website we support based in uh, the US and Australia and the UK, which brings together the business models of collaborative consumption around the world and the new ideas. And I was saying, um, I think yesterday, a, a good example of this is household drills. Do any of you own a drill at home? You know, a thing for making a hole in the wall. Yeah, I've got a few of you. Do you know how much the average drill is used in its entire lifetime? 11 minutes. So they are completely wasted. So using these platforms, you can share your drill. You can share your car, because most of you don't use your car all the time. Uh, you can maybe share your, your bed, not literally, but uh, Couchsurfing, which is a collaborative consumption website, has more beds on it than all the international hotel chains put together. Airbnb, do you all know Airbnb? You know, this is providing a new way of doing travel around the world. Again, a sharing economy solution, cheaper, more efficient than Hilton, intercontinental hotels, and all the others. What is strange, though, is most of these collaborative consumption technologies are happening in rich countries more than in poorer countries, and yet their greatest benefit should be for poor communities who have not very much money and therefore have most to benefit from creative new ideas here. The next category is new ways of using technology to find things which are otherwise invisible. And here, digital technology, I think, has a huge role to play. This is another example from um, China, which uses facial recognition technology to enable people to find their children who have been kidnapped. And I think about 30,000 children have been found using this site, Baby Come Home, a combination of the web and facial recognition technology solving a really acute social need because in China many many children are kidnapped taken to another city to work often almost as slaves. A another example of this is one of the best um, apps developed by a company in Helsinki in Finland 
called Blind Square. And this allows a blind person to walk around a city using geospatial um, uh, uh, information to tell them, here is a, a road, here is a, um, a restaurant, here is a, a, a station. And they just need to shake the phone and it tells them where they are. Very simple in some ways, very complicated in other ways. It makes the city visible, as it were, to a blind person, which would otherwise be invisible. The next category is better ways of organizing knowledge. Um, Google.org launched this um, two weeks ago, a searchable website with all of the world's constitutions on it. So if any of you want to write a constitution, I don't know, you might want to, you can now use this tool to help you do so. And, um, and another one which I was involved in is this one called Action for Happiness. And this site brings together all the world's knowledge about what makes people happy. And it makes it usable. It shows you how you can make a primary school happy a workplace happy, a university happy, with very practical examples, but also the scientific evidence behind it. And can you guess which activity makes people happiest? Which one activity, according to the scientific evidence, makes people happiest? Dancing, exactly, dancing. Which is why we should all be dancing now, not listening to me. Anyway, this is... This is another example just of organizing knowledge in new ways which are useful. And I, I was saying to friends here yesterday, this organization, which has um, a presence in nearly 120 countries, has one member of staff. All the rest of the work is done by volunteers, provide running local groups, running sessions, and providing input. On a more technological level, we have lots of examples of optimizing social resources. So this is a bit more like what you see on the screens over there. This is a use of data from Korea, where they are tracking the movement of people's smartphones around the city in order to redesign their bus routes and transport systems, but also to decide where to put public facilities like a welfare center, or, a, um, or an advisory service. They have one other very good app, which is about to go live, which I don't know if you have here in Medellin. They track every taxi journey from beginning to end, put it all into a shared database, so that you can then on your smartphone find out where, close to where you are, you will have the best chances of finding an empty taxi. And if you're a taxi driver, it will tell you whether you should turn left or right to have the best chances of finding a passenger. Again, very simple but very clever use of technology to make living in a city easier. Many examples of smarter learning. There are literally thousands of MOOCs now around the world. But this is one I just wanted to share, which is Digital Green from India again. I like it because it's not for people like are in this room. It's not for the very tech savvy people in cities, for young people. This is mainly for middle-aged, poor farmers living in villages. And it provides a combination of online learning platform, videos to provide training on farming methods, and then brings people together in peer learning groups to support each other as they become better farmers. So this is using, in some ways, MOOC technology, but for a much more powerful social impact than Coursera or Udacity or MIT, which I still think are quite disappointing in their lack of ambition in terms of educational impact. Another field of um, innovation is collective memories. And so this is an example we are launching this year in Britain to commemorate the First World War, which has its 100th anniversary next year in 2014. And this enables a museum to crowdsource people's memories. 
the things they have been given by their grandparents or great-grandparents. They may be photographs, letters, even sometimes uh, recordings. And the idea is we use digital technology to organize our shared memory in an easy way. And this is called a history pin. And this will be an open source technology which anyone can use for turning history or memory into a collective resource in a different way. You can still have the physical museum in your city, but alongside the museum you have a virtual museum of everyone's brain, everyone's memory. There's a lot of examples now of creating spaces for people to be cured for therapy using digital technology. This one called the Big White Wall creates a safe space for people with depression or schizophrenia and other mental illnesses to talk about their problems, how they feel, to help them articulate what they feel and to talk to other people like them. And this seems to be very therapeutic. No one inventing the internet had this in mind, but we are discovering that digital technologies can reach parts of the brain which maybe often the doctors and the therapists cannot uh, reach so effectively. Um, we're seeing a lot of experiment around tools for innovation. I won't say any more about that now because of time. And new tools to make government accountable to citizens. So this is the, um, the, 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 probably the most famous one in the world at the moment called I Paid a Bribe. And this is in India, and it was set up so that every time you pay a bribe to a corrupt official or politician, you record it online, and everyone else can see this person was paid a bribe. And as you can see, this has now had um, how many visits? So three, three million users so far in India. It's fueled a campaign which brought Delhi to a halt last year, and a new method of campaigning where poor people use missed calls. They make a phone call, but they don't finish the call, and this signals to the phone company's anger about corruption. And we are seeing many technologies of transparency making it much harder for states to be corrupt, to act as predators towards their people. So, just one or two more examples. So this next one is very important for us in countries like, like mine, in, in the USA and Britain and Europe, where we are using the technologies of Facebook, essentially, to create new ways of supporting people in need. And there are many dozens of examples of this kind. This is, I think, one of the best, which we have, um, we have imported from Canada. And it's called Ties. And if you have a, someone perhaps of 85, lives on their own in an apartment, has many diseases, cannot go out, this organizes their circle of support. The doctor, the social worker, but also their neighbors, their daughter or granddaughter or grandson who may live in a different city. And online, they coordinate who is going to drive the old person to the hospital. Who will cook them a meal? Who will just talk to them so they don't feel lonely? And I see an explosion of new methods of using social media to provide social support far beyond what was ever in Facebook's mind. And it has to be slightly different from Facebook, but creates value far beyond what formal professional services can do. So, I just want to make one or two final comments before opening up for you to share your ideas, your examples, or maybe to disagree strongly with what I have said. In all that I've been talking about, we are seeing the emergence of what I would call the craft of social innovation. The everyday skills of how do you come up with a useful idea, how do you test it, how do you refine it? How do you make it work? When Thomas Edison was trying to design a light bulb, 
as you know, he went through 10,000 different materials before he found the one which would work in light bulbs. In business innovation, often you have to test thousands of different ideas before you come up with the one which works. And it's the same with social innovation. It's very hard work to come up with ideas which are really ready to spread and scale. And so, going back to this, this sort of model, we have been developing the tools to help innovators at each stage. Tools for understanding problems. And one of the best tools which I encourage universities to do is a very old-fashioned tool called walking. You take a group of people and you walk around your city at random to find what are the things people need to talk to people and perhaps to find the really good innovations people are doing for themselves. In fact, walking is often a more powerful tool than searching on the web. And so I would encourage any campus party to involve a little bit of walking. There are then many tools for idea generation, many tools for prototyping and testing. And as I said, usually you need to test many, many different variants of your idea before you come up with the one ready to scale. And then we've got a growing craft knowledge of how to develop business models, revenue streams, pricing points which work for social innovations just as we need them for business and technology innovations. None of you can read this slide, I'm afraid, but on our, on our website we try then providing online resources to help people uh, go through these stages of innovation which are down the left. So behind each of these we provide uh, toolkits, case studies, advice on what skills do you need at each stage, what kinds of finance do you need at the early stage, the growth phase and so on, how do you handle risk at different stages, what kind of evidence or measurement is appropriate at different stages of innovation. Much of this is, is not rocket science but we find the social innovation field is still very young. It's still more full of good stories and anecdotes than the really hard craft which we now have in fields like medicine or technology innovation or science. And we are trying to create the same pattern of practical skills which has transformed the world through chemistry or physics or biology in the last hundred years. So, very final point, uh, earlier this year I published a book called The Locust and the Bee. And everything I've been talking about is really about how we shift the balance of our economy and our society away from the locusts. The locusts are the people who try and take things without giving anything back. And there are locusts in every government, locusts in the banking sector, locusts in business, and we have seen enormous damage done by the excessive power of the locusts in the economy of the Western world. That is what drove the financial crisis of 2007, was the empowerment of locusts. What we need is to empower the bees, the entrepreneurs, the creatives, the people generating genuine value for other people, solving their problems and their needs. And everything I've been talking about from accelerators and startup factories to prizes to new kinds of innovation funding to social innovation, these are all part of shifting the balance from the locusts towards the bees. But my very final point is that there is in a way a bit of a locust and a bee inside all of us. All of us sometimes may be pulled into jobs or positions or opportunities which make us a bit more of a predator and a bit less of a creator. And that is why I've been emphasizing how we use our brains, who we give our brains to. If you give your brain to developing a new generation of weapon systems, you are becoming a predator not a creator. Uh, and if you use your brain instead,
to find where are the most pressing needs in your society and how can you come up with creative solutions. You are a bee and you will feel better about your life and you will feel happier with your life than if you are a predator. So I will end with a little story which I tell in, in the book, which comes from Canada. And it's a story about a magician, a shaman, who meets a small boy. And the shaman says to the small boy, I have inside me two bears. One bear is violent, warlike, vicious and cruel. And the other bear is kind, cooperative, likes dancing maybe, and, uh, and is a good bear. And the young boy is frightened by this story and asks the shaman, which bear will win? Surely the cruel warlike bear will defeat the uh, kind, compassionate bear. Uh, and the, um, the shaman replies, whichever one I feed. So I ask all of you at campus party to make sure you are feeding the right bear and putting your creativity, your entrepreneurship, your skill at the service of things which matter, needs which count, tasks which in the big scheme of things are important ones, not the others. And I think I have now left a little bit of time for you to ask questions or, as I said, to violently disagree with me. Thank you. So we have, I say, a few minutes for um, comment addition. And uh, is there another microphone here? Or shall we use this one? Why don't you come and use this? And I need a... No, I, I can answer in, in English if you want. Well, uh, my question is, uh, I have an idea for a social innovation startup, but I always have this kind of... Uh, doubts about finding, for example, angel investors. Angel investors are only for the profit. And maybe government organizations are uh, too locally focused. Like uh, if, 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 the, if the municipality will have funds for it, it will think only in terms of this city. And this kind of innovation ideas or projects are, are more uh, global, are, are, are on a global scale. So I need. The angel investor goes for profit, the, go the government uh, funds go for very, very small scale solutions. So the, the recommendation what will be, like fi finding these kind of funds that you talk about that are international funds that might, uh, uh, I, might, I might approach with, with the project when it is get going? Yeah. Okay, well, um, two or three bits of an answer to your, your question. So first of all, e everywhere it is difficult, which one should I use? Uh, it is always difficult to find money for good ideas. And in business, you need, it's usually friends or family, not even angels, who provide the first bit of money for a business idea. And in social innovation as well, often you have to beg money from people who know you, very small amounts. But this is beginning to change. And we are seeing now quite large funds moving in this direction. In Europe, the most, perhaps the, the, the great um, evangelist of this was the man who created the European venture capital industry in the 1970s. He created the largest venture fund uh, and, which, and became immensely rich. And he is now pioneering the social investment world, creating these new funds. And he says we are exactly where venture capital and new generation angel investment was 30 years ago. It's still quite small, quite marginal, but he goes around the world saying that in 10 years' time, this will have tens of billions of dollars, established funds, careers, methods, uh, and so on. So in time, I think we will see answers to your question. In the meantime, I see lots of potential from things like the crowdfunding platforms. They don't generate large sums of money, but they are a good way of generating a few thousand dollars to prove your idea, and then you can take it maybe to a philanthropist, a foundation, or your city government to get it 
to the next stage. But the, the only other thing I would say is in nearly all the social innovations I've been involved in, we exaggerated how much we needed money early on. And often, when we couldn't get money, that forced us to be clever at getting other resources from people, to borrow a building, to get people to work for no money, or to get a company to lend somebody for six months, or to get given you know, old computer equipment. It's amazing what you can do without any money if you have to. And so I, I always urge people not to immediately see cash as the essential for making an innovation work. Long, long answer, sorry. <laughs> okay, who, um, yeah. Gracias, buenas noches. Hazme un favor, en todo el panorama que tú planteas, ¿cuál sería el... En el panorama que tú planteas, ¿cuál sería la formación que las universidades deberían darle a los jóvenes que están saliendo a producir en el mercado para que estén preparados para estos retos? Well, oops, sorry. <coughs> When we developed the studio school idea, we in fact originally wanted it to be a studio university. So our idea was, could we create a new kind of university where instead of going to lectures on physics or history, most of the curriculum of the university would be done through real-life problem-solving projects maybe designing an irrigation system for water, or developing new um, data applications for a city. And that if you could create a university like that where everything was rooted in real life creative problem solving, you would in fact have to learn the physics and the history, maybe, to help you solve the problems, but you would also learn how to work in a team, how to problem solve, how to communicate, how to deal with other institutions like municipalities or landowners or developers. And through that, you would learn many other skills. Um, we couldn't get that to happen in Britain, but in Finland, there is now a university doing something a little bit like this called Alto University, where most of the curriculum is done through multidisciplinary problem-solving projects with external clients. So I still think there is a need for innovation in universities. I don't say every university should be like what I've described, but there should be some parts of any university system which are much more like this, much more entrepreneurial, much more dynamic, much more problem-solving. Uh, and I'd have thought you in Colombia were very well placed to be pioneers of a new kind of university. And then in more conservative countries like Britain, we can copy what you've done. Hola, eh, mi nombre es Fabián. Eh, yo quisiera saber que algunos ejemplos de cómo ¿Cómo han escalado este tipo de negocios sociales y cómo si hay algunos que se han vuelto rentables? Ejemplos. Well, the, the examples I showed earlier have all gone to very large scale. So some, as I said, have 20 million users and they generate surpluses. They all make profit in that sense, you cannot scale unless you are making uh, a surplus. Um, I could have given other examples more from the technology field where often it is easier to scale. We're doing a workshop tomorrow morning here in Medellin, very much focused on the detail of your question of what, how do you need to think about business models in order to get to scale? And usually, it's quite challenging in social innovation as in business. Often you need to simplify your concept to make it scalable. Often you need to bring the cost structure down 
from what you start with. Also, you may find the team who are really good at the early stage of a startup, are very creative, very dynamic, are not the right team for scale. And then you need much more managerial uh, experience and competence. And often the early stage social entrepreneurs are not good at scaling their own ideas. And the same in business. You know, Steve Jobs had to be sacked by Apple because he was no good at scaling Apple. Uh, and this is normal in business. Often as you scale, you need to change your structure. You need to change your accountability model. You need to change your internal culture because what works when you are 10 people, you know, very excited, doing something new, doesn't work when you are 1,000 people or 10,000 people. So anyway, tomorrow morning, in, we are talking through what is quite a complicated set of answers to your question. But the good news for me is that there are now all over the world many, many, many examples of large-scale social innovations and social enterprises. It is not possible to say these are just small and marginal. These are big business. These employ hundreds of thousands of people. Let me give just one final example, or maybe two final examples. One is from um, a part of the world with strong connections to Medellin, the Basque country in Spain. In the Basque country in Spain is the Mondragon Cooperative Group. That now employs over 100,000 people. It operates in 30 countries, I think, now, in everything from refrigerators to aerospace to care for older people. This is an enterprise with very, very strong social values, a sense of mission, but has also proved very good at globalizing, very good at technology innovation, and very good at growth. And uh, another example I could give is from Water, one of the biggest water companies in Europe is now owned as a mutual and is proven much more efficient and much better at investment than the purely commercial water companies which always try to take too much from consumers and to invest too little. So in utilities, we're seeing also a shift to social enterprise models being more efficient. And in the US earlier this week, it was very interesting to see the spread of broadband, fiber optic broadband utilities using social ownership as a superior alternative to their cable companies, which have given much of America a bad technology, low investment, and predatory pricing from the public, whereas they want broadband to be owned at the city level and to plow the profits back into providing a better service for the people. So in everything from high technology infrastructure to aerospace, to it, to water, to food, we see social forms of ownership, social forms of enterprise, sometimes, not always, but sometimes proving more efficient than traditional commercial for-profit models. Um, I think we, oh, we have one more maybe. Uh, hi, I am studying something totally different that the majority of things that are present here in Campus Party. Yeah. I am a study dentistry. Uh -huh. And I come here because I have always believed that there is another way to, to say to the people, we can help them uh, uh, with the social things uh, yeah. in the internet. Yeah. And I would like to, and I come here because I would like to know how to say to the people that always is with me uh, how we can help the people uh, science the different things we have in internet and I would like you say to me where can I start where I can I start to say them or what I can I start to start to see to say them okay I can't give you any advice about dentistry, but I will talk about doctors, if that's okay. So we, we have been doing, in my organization, some very interesting projects working with doctors, frontline doctors. And we think there is a revolution happening in how health is organized. Where in the 20th century, most healthcare happened in hospitals 
and was done to people. The patient was entirely passive and you maybe would fix their teeth or someone would fix their heart and then they would leave. Now in most of the world, most of the health conditions which matter are long-term health conditions like diabetes or heart disease or obesity where you cannot cure it in the hospital. You require the patient to become part of the cure themselves. And so in dentistry, it would be encouraging people maybe to not to eat sweets all the time or drink soft drinks. So we've been working with doctors on what we call people-powered health, models of healthcare, which are a partnership between the doctor and the patient. And last year, we ran experiments with ways of making this real. Sometimes we did group consultations instead of individual consultations. So 10 people with the same health condition would go in and see the doctor at the same time and talk to each other about how they were looking after their diet or their fitness. And we found this much more effective for some conditions. Maybe not dentistry again, but for health. Sometimes we found new ways of prescription. So if someone is in their 80s and has many chronic diseases, you can prescribe them a drug, but usually almost any drug won't work very well. The medical evidence shows that for some people, a prescription to go to a dance class is better for their health than a prescription for a drug. So we got the doctors prescribing dance classes or going for a walk or talking to a friend instead of clinical uh, treatments. And I could give you many other examples. What's important is we measured the impact on health outcomes and the economic measures. And we were able to show that if we spread these methods across the whole UK health system, we could save between $6 billion every year and $20 billion every year. Billion, six billion, 20 billion. And our health department has been convinced by these examples and is now introducing many of these methods of people-powered health into the mainstream health system. So that healthcare, you still have hospitals, you still have doctors, you still have dentists, but we'd redesign healthcare so it is much more a partnership between the professionals and the patients. And we think of health as something which doesn't just happen in the hospital, it happens in the home, it happens as we say, 6,000 hours every year, not just the one hour or six hours where you are talking to a doctor. And if you're interested, there's lots of material on our website about this new way of thinking about healthcare, and doctors have been in the forefront of really rethinking the role of the professional. I think this is very exciting. It's social innovation. It's very practical. But the reason it is taking off in countries like mine is mainly because it saves money and maybe saves a lot of unnecessary spending for governments which don't have very much money to spend anymore. But I know nothing about dentistry. I would be interesting to know what the equivalent would be for teeth. I think maybe we are, are we out of time, perhaps? My, uh, my clock says we have run out of time, unless there is anyone wants to make one very last comment or question so instead perhaps it is time to prescribe that everyone should go dancing thank you all very much